get this done. Yeah, I think we should have. Yeah. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I see lots of you are already munching away at some meals. First of all, I want to thank Waterford at Levis Commons for sponsoring the meals today. They provided the meals. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed them. They were um, supporters through the whole pandemic for us. I know I've got a few regulars in here that were joining our Zoom programs. And um, so we're very excited to have you in here. We do this once a month and we do a variety of different programs. So make sure you keep an eye on each program every month in our newsletter. Um, we already have our January newsletter published. So if you want to pick one up downstairs at the front desk, you're more than welcome to do so. Hi, right, come on in. Wow. Come on in. There's a spot in the middle there and there's also a spot for that. Hello. Oh. I'm letting someone in here. So then um, today, we're very lucky, obviously, for those of you that are with us in person, we do have some people coming on virtually. Um, this is Jim Witter. He is from the Wood County Park District. And in my opinion, we have the best park district around. And so we're very, very fortunate to have Jim here. Um, we also have had other programs through the another naturalist. As yeah, well. yeah, natural senior naturalist Bill. Yes, uh, yeah, came yes. Here. And yeah. today's presentation is on winter birds. So I'm assuming a lot of you are either bird fans in general or just a fan of the park district. So oh. Without oh. further ado, yeah. thank you so much yeah. for being here. Can Thanks you? so much for that invitation. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. We're, We're excited to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks to Liz, uh, too, and uh, Rita. Always great to, to be out here. And uh, I think it was just a couple months ago I was here for the first time. And, wow, this is this is pretty spectacular. This is pretty nice. Yes, yes. And uh, and some of you may have been to uh, some of the Wood County Parks programming. I, I remember Lynn Long has been. To, yes, hello. Good to see you. It's been to many park programs and. Um, we're, we're uh, on our website, wcparks.org. We have a list of programs. They, they kind of go through the air. Folks tend to think that we kind of hibernate in the wintertime, not as much outdoor stuff, but we're, we're still out there. I mean, we've even done snowshoe programs here at the Black Swamp Preserve, uh, just near uh, Walmart. We have a little park uh, there, uh, as well as hikes and things going on uh, through the air. So yeah, you can find us there. Of course, we're also out in the community like this, doing requested programs. and. Uh, different uh, natural history adventure programs and today uh, talking about uh, winter visitors winter birds um, and while I was kind of going through and putting the presentation together I was just saying oh man there's, there's so many different there's lots of winter birds I could talk about I could go all kinds of directions but we'll be talking about there are some birds that actually uh, sound strange I think of uh, during migration uh, with bird movement that uh, birds are leaving even though it's not so it's too cold, which which they certainly are. But believe it or not, there are actually some birds for Ohio itself is coming down here for them. So there are some of the visitors that actually come further south into Ohio that I'll kind of uh, run through here quick. Some of them are, are fairly rare visitors. And then, of course, I'll also talk about some of the, the regular winter birds, especially to your bird feeders. This is a, a good time of the year to get out your uh, bird feeders. Uh, food is relatively scarce. Um, uh, most birds, even ones that you'll see your feeders during the spring and summer, are eating lots of insects and caterpillars and things like that. Not so many insects uh, easily available, unless you're a woodpecker. We'll get to that, talk about what they do during the winter time. But some of the regular feeder birds we'll talk about, as well as a couple of groups of birds, woodpeckers and owls. They're just kind of year round resident groups of birds that are really well adapted. So we'll kind of cover them too, as well as some birds that uh, we even see um, kind of rarely. And figure out how oh, to here. use the oak. Yeah. Yes, power cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Or connect. Oh, maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's connect. Sometimes it just needs to. Oh, 
Well, I'll just click for you. Go Come ahead. on. Oh, wait, here we go. Here. Oh, oh, it's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> we got it. Thanks, Rita. You're welcome. Ruby, do you tell Rita? Thank you. So, yeah, on the, uh, starting off, uh, these are some of the birds uh, talking about that actually come from the north. Uh, some of them come on like an annual basis. They're always here. And some of them you might only see periodically. They might not even be in Ohio uh, during a certain winter. And then other uh, years, they have uh, a whole bunch of this certain species uh, or species that come down into Ohio. And we'll kind of talk about uh, right there uh, why that is, what kind of, uh, you know, kind of predicates, what kind of influences these movements. And um, some, uh, uh, right, I said, are not uh, year round and will leave actually. So when they do leave, um, oftentimes in late winter, early spring, they're gonna go further up north uh, to breed, to uh, build their nests. Uh, and so we won't see them past about kind of late winter, early spring generally. And uh, also though, there can be sort of an additional benefit of getting away from like an Arctic winter that is uh, really cold. Uh, some of these birds uh, are pretty well adapted uh, to cold. And so the movements uh, are generally more predicated on uh, food resources. So if you have uh, a good amount of food and, and their food generally often is seeds this time of the year, if you have a good source of food, even out further north, you might just kind of stay up there rather than traveling and undergoing all the kind of threats that uh, you might endure through, uh, through movement, through migrating. But um, if you don't have a lot of food, you're going to come down here uh, into the uh, United States. Basically, wherever the food is, that's where you're going to go. And sometimes it does turn out to be Ohio. And this is one, uh, it's uh, one that probably we have on almost like a, an annual, pretty regular basis, the common red pole, but it's not, not terribly common uh, bird, even uh, during the winter time. So you will see them. They're kind of a, a pretty, pretty bird that sometimes will come to Ah, uh, no, not on. Yeah, I will say it. I don't have the sound built in there, but a really good resource for hearing, uh, or uh, hearing the birds as well as all of the uh, resources for them uh, is called All About Birds through Cornell University. And online, um, they uh, have kind of all those uh, sound resources, including lots of. I'm writing it down. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's called. If you just. Uh, Google all about birds, it'll get you to, to Cornell University. And then they're kind of like, they have the lab of ornithology at Cornell and they are kind of the, the biggest, uh, yeah, source of bird research and knowledge. And as uh, we'll kind of talk about it for an article, they're always learning more things. Sometimes it seems like, oh boy, we got our technology and fancy things and is always, always learning more uh, on, uh, let's see, yeah. Right. Wow. <laughs> That's all right. That's what this is, this backup system. Is That's for. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. So, yes. Um, part of. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Rita. Yeah. Um, so, the uh, eruptions here, right? Not, not eruptions, not like a volcano, but uh, this eruption uh, talks about the kind of these uh, movements that are predicated on kind of the food resources. And so, they're kind of, you uh, can think of eruptions as irregular. Sometimes you'll have a whole lot of the uh, little pine siskin uh, down there. Um, and sometimes you might not have uh, very many at all, or sometimes it might not be here uh, in Ohio. And um, of course, right, um, oftentimes bird watchers, they will follow, they have predictions, uh, sometimes from Cornell Lab of Ornithology about based on the food uh, crop uh, for a pine siskin, uh, it's gonna be a kind of small uh, seeds, sometimes the little pine seeds, uh, and, and seed up further north based on what the, uh, the crop of seed is like further up north will probably dictate how many are going to come down here. And so I do remember last year, it was a very good year for pine systems. And, and we often see them in sizable flocks, about 50 or 60. In fact, even in West Toledo, I saw a flock of them flying around. And they kind of sound like, uh, I can make their sound. Yes, perfect, Jim. Don't have the, the sound file for it, but they kind of sound like kind of the goldfinches making it, right? Right? Except they do like this kind of like wow. this little kind of little buzz, buzz, the kind of buzz sound, uh, and it's kind of chirpy. Um, and um, they are, of course, um, a lot of time with these pictures, it, it's very difficult to get, to get like a size of what that, how big that is. They're about the size of a goldfinch too. They're, they're fairly, fairly small, and and they are a 
technically a finch. Uh, they're named pine siskin, but they're a finch with a very small beak, and they do like uh, if you have uh, feeders at your house, they like the, the thistle or the Niger seed. They're pretty specific because they have a very kind of uh, cone shaped, very small beak that uh, most birds do like some of the bigger sunflower seeds, but they really like that Niger or thistle uh, seed. And yeah, all right, we'll go to the next uh, slide. And here's some of the species that uh, we have on a regular basis. Yeah, so you can see, uh, ooh, and ah, uh, yeah, that <laughs> evening growth beak. Uh, as a matter of fact, it had an interruptive year where we had a whole lot of them uh, just last season. Uh, we had, in terms of, uh, I always think like, oh, there's been a lot. Um, a lot for the evening growth speaks may have been uh, a handful of sightings of about like eight or 10. Um, and, and then uh, we might not see them uh, the rest of the winter. I was like, man, I'm, I'm missing out. It's still, uh, sometimes for like, if something as rare as the evening growth speak, um, even just a, a couple sightings of a couple of flocks is an unusual number because often many years you don't see the evening growth speaks here at all. You might go, you know, maybe eight or 10 years before another group will oh, wow. come. Yeah, yeah, they are fairly rare um, compared to the pine siskin. It's more like every, maybe every year or two, or there's probably some on some kind of small scale. So it kind of depends on the species, but the evening growth speak is not a very common one, but a very if, if you saw that bird at your feeder, you'd yeah. probably know like that's something different. There's something different there. And mm. of course the bird watchers get really excited about it. And so, yeah, there, that's kind of the list of species that uh, going from uh, kind of some of the more common, the purple finch is another one that we kind of see migrating and we see during the winter time, the pine siskin and onto some of the more rare species that we only see every once in a blue moon, the, the pine grows beak, the evening grows beak, um, yeah. When All you right. Mean last season, you mean last winter? Yes, yes. So that would be last kind of last fall, kind of late fall uh, into winter and through late winter. Yeah, yep, yep. That's when they were being seen. I believe they were uh, the evening growth beak being seen as early as like mid to late November and into December. Yeah, yep. Mm. Yeah. Ready for the next? Yeah, ready for the next one. And so we'll go through kind of a quick some little profiles of these. Uh, different birds. I uh, have the purple finch, and it looks does look very similar to one of our more kind of common birds, the house finch. So the purple finch is there on top, and the house finch on the bottom. It's a little bit more kind of pinkish, kind of raspberry colored, less kind of striping, brown stripes on uh, on its body. And uh, it's one that definitely uh, they've noticed that they've done the research uh, is not as common uh, as it used to be. I think partly because of the house finch. It's a bit more of an aggressive bird. It used to be a Western bird and was actually introduced to the East and sort of outcompeted sometimes the, uh, the purple finch. And um, it, it's one that we do see probably on, on the regular, on uh, in the winter time and even during uh, migration. And with their beak a little bit bigger than that pine siskin beak, like many birds, if you get black oil sunflower seeds or even a black oil sunflower seed mix, that's probably the best all around seed. Also the most expensive seed, which is why they have yeah. the, the mixes. I know, like, yeah, we we tend to the parts of them get the mixes with different because then yeah, you get expensive just the plain and the whole black sunflower seeds. All right, go to the I next think bird. Better birds, so we need some better seeds. This is true. So the comment was made: you get the better birds when you get the better seeds. Also true. Yeah. <laughs> they always say like when, when they're asking um, if you really get into bird watching, like, well, what kind of binoculars should I have? What, 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 what's the best kind? Like, well. The best kinds are the best kind you can afford because they get real expensive. But this is true. Yes, yeah, but that, those sunflower seeds are, are good. And then I have a little comparison there. On the top is the pine siskin, and on the bottom is the more kind of familiar American goldfinch. And we have those that are backyard feeders, American goldfinch. That's its winter uh, plumage. You're probably familiar with the summer, you know, the bright yellow with the black wings, uh, wild canaries, as uh, some folks call them. And uh, that one, probably a male, it does have sometimes you can see a little bit of yellow. Sometimes it just looks more plain brown and lots more stripy uh, than uh, the goldfinch, but about uh, the same size. The beak might even be a little bit smaller too. It's a pretty small, small beak. And interesting um, with this kind of the, the life history um, of these birds is that um, most birds, you can see like your robins. So this time of the year, we do have some wintering robins and they'll be together in flocks. However, during a springtime, they'll start to separate and they're going to be territorial and put up their, uh, their nests. 
So they're going to be skirmishing with other generally males. Males are fighting with territories. And um, what's different about the plain siskin is sometimes they will nest kind of colonially, like in a group where they find a, a lot of seed. Uh, sometimes they'll even nest pretty early uh, in the springtime and nest together in kind of loose groups. So uh, much less territorial than a lot of birds like the red winged blackbirds always chasing each other around and the, and the, the American robins, yeah. Oh, they have, they have separate feeders for the, uh, the separate feeders for the uh, uh, yeah. finches and for the other birds? Yeah, you know, I, I would say it's interesting. Like the goldfinch, uh, they say that they also preferred like that niger or thistle with small seeds. I've seen them go to the, uh, the sunflowers as well, too, mm -hmm. as much as anything. Um, I would say that if you're trying to get uh, if you're trying to get the siskins there, they do really they kind of specialize on that uh, thistle or niger seed. But I've even seen the goldfinches go to the uh, the sunflower. It can be good though. I'm trying to get a, a different number of birds. Sometimes they have a little bit different types of seed. But for all around, I say the black sunflowers are are pretty good. Yeah. All right. We'll go on to the the next one. Yes, and I kind of saw a picture of it. Uh, the common red pole. Uh, sort of a similar, kind of as a small beak there, uh, finch-like. An interesting adaptation that I was reading about, that they're able to store seeds in like a throat pouch. Many birds um, will kind of hide them, and probably the uh, red pole does this as well. Will actually grab seeds. If you've seen the black-capped chickadee, it's pretty familiar. They'll go and grab a seed, and they'll leave. Where'd they go? They'll grab a seed, and they'll leave. So they are caching them, they're storing them. Uh, usually in like tree cavities or some kind of place. So they're stashing them all. And um, the uh, red pole there is able to actually store them in a throat pouch, uh, kind of like, uh, almost like a, uh, a chipmunk. <laughs> they're, they're, big, they're big cheeks, so they have like a little uh, pouch there. And uh, the interesting, as that kind of last point has, that um, they can even go uh, fairly, uh, you know, south into Kentucky, into some southern states. Um, in search uh, of food. So they, they will travel uh, from a bird that, you know, will nest kind of up into, you know, well into Canada or into the Arctic. They'll come way down there, uh, wherever the food is, they will come and find it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Next. Will they nest in boxes? Ah, that's a good question. They, they're uh, common red pole and nesting. Um, I believe that, I don't think that they are a cavity nester, like a box okay. nester. I think that they do um, they do build nests, though I am not sure. I will have to look up that common red pole to see like what type of nesting. And mm -hmm. oftentimes it does depend on birds. I'm guessing kind of for, uh, far up north, it might be even like in a bush or kind of a, a, a small a small tree. I'd like to, I'm curious now. <laughs> common red pole <laughs> nesting. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, this is good. Good question. Thanks for that. <laughs> And uh, this is another one you'll probably see on a fairly uh, semi-regular basis and uh, that's pretty well uh, adapted for eating uh, pine seeds. Uh, it's a red crossbill. And uh, if you look at, at their bill, it does look like one of those uh, uh, kind of environmental horror stories where there's some kind of like environmental toxin and we have the bird's beaks that are kind of misshapen. <laughs> um, however, their, their beak is crossed and it's actually designed like that. So uh, with the crossbill, they had kind of used this kind of cross beak to kind of pry open the kind of the scales of the cone. And they actually use their tongue to pop out the seed. So like very specifically adapted to kind of get under there, open up the, the scales, and then use your tongue to pop out the seed. So they'll go after those coniferous uh, trees. And um, you know, sort of like the interesting uh, kind of adaptation to like the pine siskin, uh, wherever they can find uh, you know, seeds, uh, if they find a whole lot of it, they might, uh, you know, just a reliable source of food, they might nest even in a season, generally like spring and summertime is, is the year, uh, is the time of the year that you'll nest. But since they're kind of more dependent on the, the seeds, if they find a good source of food, especially in uh, kind of places kind of around the country that are a little bit more temperate um, and kind of had a, have a climate that's more kind of um, uh, level that they will kind of breed during different times of the year. And uh, interesting, so I have the right crossbill up there. I tried to put a picture in. That's the white winged crossbill on the bottom, another kind of a, a cousin that we see that they've done a lot of research on that 10 different uh, species that it depends kind of on the scientists that they have sort of split uh, what appears to us just kind of looking at the bird, you're like, that's the same bird, that's the same bird. But based on kind of like their calls and even getting down to like the genetic like blood type level that some 
ornithologist, bird scientist would say like, oh, that's a different, that's a different species of crossbill, and that's a different species of crossbill. So it's sort of uh, interesting um, as they study these things that they can be all sort of separate kind of uh, species uh, from each other. All right, go on to the next bird. Yes, and the pine grosbeak uh, right here is another uh, pretty distinct one. It's a kind of a sizable bird, about almost about the size of a robin, kind of big, big bodied. Um, and that is one that we don't see a whole lot. Maybe kind of the most rare one that I remember looking for them really well, uh, even as far north as the upper peninsula. They're still not too common, even up there. So down here, pretty rare. Um, and when they do come down there, um, in fact, I think I saw one eating a crab apple uh, in a picture. Unfortunately, I don't think I've ever seen them down here. I've been around and looking for them down here when they have visited, but haven't got a chance to see them. But yes, from that beak, larger seeds and eating a lot of the fruit and seeds, which is what you know, plenty of the birds that do winter here. Um, that, that's the main thing with the robins. Of course, the, the ground being frozen, not so many worms and you know ground creatures. So they're switching to the fruit. And so um, that's the male right there. And the, the female is a little bit more kind of greenish, uh, kind of greenish yellow. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty, a pretty bird. All right, go to the next one. Yes. And so I uh, think the last of kind of the rare, more of that kind of the rare winter visitors, uh, the evening uh, gross beak. And um, that's another one that kind of often will gather in flocks. And uh, yes, pretty, pretty distinctive. Definitely different than the goldfinch, just that yellow, but definitely a larger body bird. It's a little bit bigger and has that really big uh, beak, uh, kind of like its cousin, uh, the rose breasted grosbeak, beak that um, we'll have during the springtime, especially during migration. And even we'll have some of those rose breasted grosbeaks beaks um, that will nest here. Uh, that's a, a colorful bird. But this one, yeah, just in the, the wintertime and uh, on occasional. Uh, occasional years, and again, like the red pole, they'll head as far, pretty far south uh, if they're looking for food. So um, the birds that were here uh, last kind of late fall and winter uh, may have just kind of been passing through, because they were, were passing through, it might have gone further south looking uh, for food. So uh, yeah, a pretty, a pretty uh, distinctive and neat looking bird. Yeah. And yeah, so here's kind of a uh, uh, a, a picture, I have a, a couple uh, of our common uh, winter residents. Uh, one of the most uh, familiar we see a lot is that dark-eyed junco. In fact, some folks call those the snowbirds. When the snow comes, you're going to have your juncos uh, there in the top uh, left uh, picture. And I start to see them, I think it's about like end of September, early October, they start to come back. And um, they will hang out here uh, through the winter, often in flocks. So it's not just see them uh, in flocks uh, on into kind of like the early spring. In fact, it kind of, it throws me off every springtime that they will start to sing as kind of the days get longer. And, like, and they haven't been singing, of course, uh, all winter long. <laughs> generally, birds generally don't sing. Sometimes they will sing, but the, the males will start singing. Like, what, what is that? Yeah, I like it. I don't think I've heard that one, but I, I like it after the first jump call. I'm going to keep track of that now. <laughs> Good. Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks after I see the first first jump call in Paris. I'll also do like a. <laughs> yes, and so yes, we, we see them during the winter time in a pretty distinctive bird. Interesting too that um, I saw a flock in the yard, and they were uh, they're always like a lot of the birds are on the ground pecking and poking around it, it's who knows what. And uh, I'd uh, not cleared all of the leaves. I had some in the backyard because they say to leave if you can, probably you know, irritate your neighbors, but if you can keep a section of your backyard, maybe not the front yard covered in leaves, but you can keep some leaves in the, you know some places of landscaping or something where they're not gonna fool around too much, but there will be you know, creatures that will be uh, there in the leaves, next to them, in the leaves or under the leaves. And sure enough, I uh, jumped out, poking around, tried to grab it. Uh, this was like, yeah, this uh, about early December last year. It was a big green caterpillar <laughs> that was there in the, in, the, in the leaves. I was like, ah, okay. I, yeah, I wouldn't have thought there'd be anything much in there to, to grab. But yeah, sure enough, it, it found some, still some insects to, to eat. Uh, and then in the top right there, another one fairly uh, fairly common, the, the tree sparrow, another one that comes from the, the far north, has a little kind of black dot on its chest, a kind of a reddish brown head, and that beak that's kind of yellow and, and gray. 
Another one uh, familiar, uh, the white-throated sparrow there in the bottom left, and it is one like with the cardinal that sings. It'll actually sing in the winter time occasionally too. And then you have the picture uh, in a distinctive behavior there is a nuthatch. So they are the one of the only birds that will head down a tree looking for usually insects and spiders and and seeds, kind of head first spiraling down the tree. The upside down bird. The upside down bird. <laughs> I like it even more than I know that sometimes the goldfinches will kind of hang upside down that behavior for kind of eating uh, kind of seeds on like a flower. But uh, the nuthatch, yes, they're just you know, almost like a, a relative to the woodpecker that they will head down kind of head first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As well as kind of the other familiar ones here, of course, the northern cardinal, the old pit mouse, and uh, the black capped chickadee, uh, too. I didn't have space to put it there. But interesting, they have found that. During the winter time, kind of late uh, in the fall, in the winter, that they will actually grow their brain connections because they need to remember where all the different seeds are. So they actually their brain will grow new neural neural connections to remember. And then by spring, there's a lot more food. All the caterpillars are coming out, and I think I don't have to remember where everything is. So they'll actually like they'll they'll tear them away. So kind of those neurons disappear. Yeah. They'll become. Stupider, <laughs> at least less <laughs> stupider. Then they won't remember as well. The rest of them will remember how to get away from predators, and they, but they will not remember all, all the things yeah. until they grow them the next, so next season. So I know I, I I can't remember how they figured that out, but they did figure Is out. Is that what they mean by bird brain? Bird, <laughs> yeah. Birds, yeah, you know, some of them, the blue jays and the crows are pretty smart. The rest of them, morning doves. Morning doves seem to be, and judging from my own experience, there is one that kept trying to nest in the, the house, the gutter. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is not going to work out. And it keeps, like every year, <laughs> not good. Okay, we'll, we'll see what happens. That's funny. Yeah. All right, we'll go on to the, the, the next one. And the next slide, we got the woodpeckers too. And this is another yeah. bird that we see all winter long. Um, and uh, they are pretty well adapted uh, for uh, the winter. So they actually, um, oftentimes when they're uh, kind of pecking uh, on the bark and knocking the things, there will be insects underneath there kind of spending the winter under the bark. And so their, their food is still underneath there. And so actually have, uh, excuse my wife, she's like, I didn't realize there's so many woodpeckers. I thought it was like Woody, Woody the woodpecker. That was, <laughs> that was, that was woodpecker. I was like, oh no, come on. There's like six different woodpeckers. There's the, the most common one you'll probably see in town in the park is that downy woodpecker on the upper left. Um, it's fairly, fairly small woodpecker. And then uh, you can't tell from the, uh, the picture next to it, it does look smaller, but the, the hairy woodpecker just to the mm -hmm. right looks almost identical. But uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, says, uh, tell them apart, that its beak is bigger compared to its head. It has a longer proportion. Yep, a longer proportion its beak, even though their coloration, they're both black and white, little red dot for the males, looks very similar. And then uh, another bird, there, it seems like the one on that top right should be the red-headed woodpecker, but the red-headed woodpecker is actually the one on the bottom there with, with even more red. So that's the red-bellied woodpecker, and the way it's got, got its name is when Audubon was studying them, of course, we didn't have good binocular optics, he would just blast them out of the sky. When you have them belly up in your, in your, your taxidermy jar, you're like, oh, obviously, the red-bellied woodpecker, and, and then now we look at them, of course, they're against the tree, like, I don't know. I don't see the red belly. When I see a red head. But, but yes, uh, another interesting that red belly woodpeckers are becoming more common. They used to be a southern bird, and now they've started to expand their range up further north. Uh, another one, kind of one of the, the neat, uh, almost like the woody woodpecker uh, woodpeckers, is down there on the bottom left is the pileated woodpecker. And hard to tell from that picture, but that bird is about the size of a crow. So a big woodpecker. And in fact, in the area, we don't have too many of them. They tend to like Lots of big woods. We've kind of, you know, uh, developed and kind of farmed our way to mostly woodlots around Wood County. But I've seen and heard them at uh, Harrison Park near Pemberville and also Winter Garden Park. There's a big enough woods there that they've uh, seen and heard them at Winter Garden Park. And you would remember if you saw a woodpecker that big and for folks yeah. they have to, like, yeah, that's, I know. Yeah. When yeah. we were down in Florida, my brother oh, told yeah. me to take this certain path. Yes, yes. I told my sister and I. And he had a nest over there. Oh, wow. And he didn't tell us this bird's going to try to run us over. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, my God. Here come this bird at us. <laughs> and we're going, what? That's that's big, and that is a big that's a big bird to be He's coming at you <laughs> i can tell you especially if it's buzzing by your head mm -hmm. that's a that's a large large bird he was coming at us yeah <laughs> <laughs> i can 
imagine that. <laughs> That's kind of alarming, especially mm -hmm. when birds are, are close to you. Yes. <laughs> And the red-headed woodpecker is another one. We see them a lot at Oak Openings Metro Park, our neighbors to, to the north, but also have seen them a, a, a good number of places. Carter Historic Farm, we see them in Harrison Park uh, in Pemberville. And sometimes uh, golf courses, for whatever reason, it seems like they like those big mature trees, but also a little bit of like open areas where it's not, uh, it doesn't need to be completely forested. And so we, we see them a good amount too in, uh, in Wood County. And that yellow-bellied sapsucker, an actual bird, sounds like something like, like the uh, snipe hunt. Yellow-bellied sapsucker is there in the bottom right. And it is one that we, we don't see much in the wintertime. We actually see more of them always like during spring and fall. They're, they're very migratory, more migratory and moving around than the other, uh, the other woodpeckers. And so we'll usually see those, yeah, things like March, April, and then towards like the kind of September, uh, October, we'll see them moving through. Um, and uh, interesting, also, I, I found this sort of fascinating that um, rather than eating, they will eat insects, but they'll often drill holes, uh, the, the name of sap, and get to the sap. And when they're coming through in the springtime, that the hummingbirds will actually be attracted to the holes, both to drink the, of course, the, the sap, but also for the insects. The insects will kind of come around the sap and they'll be attracted there. And the hummingbirds will be eating the insects, probably as well as the sap suckers are eating the insects that are attracted there. So but that's kind of interesting. And yeah, it's a good, good question. The sap sucker is probably a, a, a list up maybe a touch larger than that hairy woodpecker. Uh, between all of those birds, let's see, the sap sucker would be maybe a, a bit smaller than a robin. Yeah, about okay. nine or 10 inches. Yeah, kind of a sort of a medium to small size woodpecker with the uh, downy being the smallest. Of course, the pileated would be the, the largest. And then red bellied is the red headed, about the same size, maybe about. Uh, around a, a blue jay, a little bit smaller than a blue jay size. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we'll come here to one of the the last uh, slides here. Yes, the owls. And I thought, man, I have to keep I have to put owls in there, being winter kind of uh, often year round uh, birds. Um, and so the I put the uh, most common. I didn't put all the owls. We do have several owls, but the most kind of common ones there. Uh, that's a one on the top uh, left. The eastern screech owl is the one we probably have the most commonly seen. And it's just about 10 inches tall. It's a small, a small bird. And that uh, actually comes in two color phases. That's the red phase. It's kind of neat, a reddish brown. Uh, most of the birds that we see are actually a gray phase and pretty well camouflaged. But even you can see that color kind of tree-like that they uh, blend in. And then kind of on the right, again, a, a small picture but of, a, of a larger bird, probably about a foot and a half is the barred owl with those kind of chests uh, or bars on its chest. And that is one that we don't see a whole lot in wood pine. They like kind of big, big woods. Uh, they see them a, a fair amount up in oak openings and Secor Metro Park uh, places up there and haven't uh, caught a lot of them um, there. But definitely they have a, a pretty, they're known for their call. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it kind of sounds like some people think it's calling. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it, if you heard that, I think a lot of people would not recognize it as an owl. Like, don't know what that is. And then the screech owl kind of sounds like ever heard like this kind of whinnying. That's uh, uh a screech owl. That, mm. uh, definitely a, a different kind of noise. People are like, I don't know what what is that. And then maybe the most familiar, of course, the great horned owl. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That, that's your, your, you know, that sounds like an owl. <laughs> that's supposed to sound like. And interesting, uh, the great horned owl, I thought I'd put them in the, the winter birds because uh, this is the time during the winter that they're most vocal. They're kind of establishing territories, they're talking back and forth to each other. And for the great horned owl, they're our earliest nest, they're probably earlier than any other bird. And so they'll be nesting right here in like January or early February. Uh, they'll be laying eggs. And I suppose that does, think about it, makes sense that uh, since they're nocturnal predators, you have the longest nights, you know, the most time to go and kind of sneak up and look for things. And also, uh, it's sort of a, a joke, uh, maybe a bit of a sick joke, I guess, with the, <laughs> with the naturalist. Like, well, it's also good timing that as you know, your, your, your offspring are getting larger, well, that's when you know, they're getting bigger and they're growing, and that's when all the other baby creatures are hatching out that don't oh. just, that are stumbling out of their nest. Like, hey, the great horned owl is coming out. <laughs> 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 
what a lovely world just before. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of weird. That's how naturalists think, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. It, it, it is. Like, life. I got to eat, and I'm really good at it. Interesting, too, the great horned owl is one of the only predators that they found. They will eat a skunk. They oh, have a wow. really good wow. eyesight and a really good hearing, but the smell apparently is not very well developed. <laughs> great horned owl. <laughs> They've been known to eat skunks. And I do. I told I've told that story for 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 years. But then I read something, and I came across it like, well, how often? Like, do they really enjoy that? Is that good? And so they 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 studied it. Like, yeah, they don't really eat a lot of them. It tends oh. to not be the number one thing, but but they will. <laughs> yeah, right. Compared to like, I guess the the like coyotes and like foxes, the things that you know, the other predators, like they have a very well developed sense of smell, so they avoid them. Like the like the plague, and there's one. I think they were studying coyotes that had like a camera on it, and it was moving very tentatively. And then, like you see from the camera, something kind of came out of this burrow. And all of a sudden, coyote froze, and you see it turn around. All the grass is coming out. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. That's funny. Get away from from that skunk. Ah, yes, a good question. So the barn barn owl, um, it is one that uh, I have seen here. Uh, it actually is a bit migratory, at least around here. We don't really have uh, too many, uh, though actually that's here. In fact, it was like a bird uh, during kind of previous kind of agricultural periods where we had more of them. And kind of the way uh, with kind of a more aluminum barns and even kind of the farming methods changing a little bit, kind of larger farms. Uh, we don't see nearly as many. The place where they still do see them and year round too, kind of all year, uh, is around kind of like the Amish area, kind of north central Ohio, kind of Holmes County. They still have kind of you know, either older barns, older wooden barns, or kind of different farming uh, kind of practices where they still do have some that are year round residents. And I saw one, just one in this area out at McGee Marsh, and it was a bird that they thought was, was migrating, this bird kind of moving, passing through. Uh, but it is a bird that we have seen in uh, Wood County. And it's possible that. There still might be uh, be one that they could uh, they could breed here, but I, I have not heard or, or seen of one in a while. Yeah, um, and then of course I, I thought I put have to put in the snowy owl. And Wood County is a, a good place uh, for for snowy owls to come in the winter time because it does remind them of home. Very flat, no trees. <laughs> um, they've been to like airports too, so uh, and as well as um, uh, especially up on Lake Erie. Uh, sometimes I like kind of that open, definitely an open uh, land uh, bird uh, and being out near uh, a lake or along that Wood County uh, agricultural kind of countryside. Um, they, they will show up here um, and, and some years more than others. It's interesting that uh, in terms of food, uh, it was sort of thought that uh, the snowy owls were coming down a lot into Ohio because like they were starving, they were really hungry. And they were looking for uh, food. It actually turns out um, the years that we have more or less birds, it's based on how well the previous breeding season was. So if there are a whole lot um, of food of like the lemmings or little rodents, if their population are kind of cyclic, will go up and down. If they have a really good breeding season, there's a whole bunch of owls, but there's not enough food for them up north. So they got to come down. And um, if it was not a very good breeding season, there might not be a lot of birds that survive. And so they might not come down here. There's probably enough food to go around what's left up there. Maybe uh, not a lot of uh, offspring survived. Or sometimes uh, they can also, I think, uh, sort of base how many eggs they're going to lay on how many, how much food. You'll even see, I think, maybe these pictures of where they have their ground, actual nest right on the ground. And there will be eggs surrounded by like a pile of lemmings. <laughs> just like, just like we're ready. We're ready, we're ready for them to, to hatch out. And, and apparently, I guess even up north there, it's like they tend to not like to eat, you know, like old rancid food, but apparently it's chilly enough. You just kind of stockpile like, pile of food that they hatch out and you're just shoving food into them left and right. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of uh, what they think is the uh, main kind of predictor of their kind of movement into uh, Ohio and area south. Yeah. There was a snowy owl spotted north and bowling green about a week, week and a half. Oh, good. Really good. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Because we live right across from the Fairbuilding, and one evening, I just happened to be standing in the kitchen, and I looked out, and I saw this big white bird fly. Oh, I had no idea, so cool. not a clue what yeah. it was. And then later on that day, um, Chris. Oh, 
Uh, Chris Geifich? Yeah. I thought that was a city park. Yeah. I posted yeah. a picture of wow. like, three pictures that somebody had captured of, and he said it was a snowy owl that oh, nice. on the teardrop. Ah, uh, that's that's neat. So, uh, I didn't that's know that. Yes, yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 that's a good story. It's like perfect. It's it's the one for, of course. There's a Harry Potter fan. Harry Potter fan. Like it's the the Harry Potter verse. See that one. <laughs> and also the one like like it's even if you're like no oh, whatever you know, birds whatever. It's one that like it's both impressive enough. Like even yeah. if you're a bird watcher, like. Well, that's cool. That, that, that's now that's a bird. Now they're little sparrow birds and stuff going around. Yeah, I forget that. But, uh, that's a cool bird. And also one that's like, I feel like this is a thing too. There will be actual bird watchers. Like, I want to go see it. And it's like the more that you want to go see it, it's not going to show up. Right. Show up right. I want to go see it. There's this thing right here. Where is it? And then the people like driving on their driving to work, or it's like find a couple of cops. What is that? And, like it just shows up at random. It just like comes there and it's out, out by your house or you're driving down the road. I'm like. Huh. What on earth? That, that's something different. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think what would be. I said to my husband, I said there was a big white bird. I was like, what could it have been? I said, maybe a lost egret, you know, or something. Right, right. Yeah. Idea, you know? Out of season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only thing. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm used to seeing that. They're like flying Yeah. You know? Yes, yes, <laughs> they, they are. That, that's a perfect thing. That's a perfect description. About as close to a modern day pterodactyl that will be oh. the great blue heron. In fact, one of our our naturalists, yeah, naturalist Bill, has been here to talk. He also um, worked at uh, Nature's Nursery where they rehabilitate the wild animals, and um, he was coming to help. Uh, there was a, a, a great blue heron that was injured, and uh, the uh, director there gave him a pair of a goggles. Right, you're gonna you're gonna need these. <laughs> and like what? And like when you get up close again, like get up close to birds, like that's a big bird. And sure enough, like this, this beat this big poke right in his right in his eye. Wow. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Fine. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, they, they are flying targets. And uh, interesting that with like birds like they think, well, oh man, it's cold for a heron. Some of them, as long as they can find like uh, like open water, like they're, they're gonna you know eat frogs and fish and things. If there's enough open water, they'll hang out. And I, I know that even there have been some that decide like, okay, I'm gonna stick it out over the winter. And they've been like, I think found like a, like they'll be standing like in the ice, like oh, it's not, oh my it's not, God. It's not good. Some of them they 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 try to overwinter and it, and it doesn't work out. But it seems like you know, some of these relatively warm winters, or at least like we haven't had extended freezes, that, that they'll find enough food that they'll just kind of hang out here. I, I, I've even seen them like the uh, near the water treatment plant where they're releasing that, that water. There'll be enough water there in the, you know, the ditches, po ditch that I'll see them there kind of on the regular. And we'll see them on our Christmas, Rudolph Christmas bird count coming up around the kind of bold green area. They usually have a couple great blue herons, Bells and Kingfishers, that there's still enough water. They'll be diving in there after fish. And uh, yeah, I think that is, yeah, I believe that was the mm -hmm. last slide that, that I had, yeah. right? And that's just a, a, a sample, you know, that's a, a, a while. So lots of, lots to talk about with, with birds. But um, um, another thing I was thinking about too, I didn't like put it in there, but if you have feeders or like to, you know, uh, do uh, washing the feeders, there's a project through Cornell University called Feeder Watch, where uh, there is like a fee to join the project, but you report your birds scientists use the, the data and they've come up with some interesting thing they found that nuthatches while they're year-round residents are actually fairly migratory too they would see like 20 or 30 at a time flying like what I don't know mm -hmm. and that they also are, are kind of responding to the food sources mm -hmm. though we see them all winter long they'll sometimes move in big numbers up to where the food is most prevalent but yeah yeah my friend Pete puts out red jelly what is that for ah yes yes so, so the grape jelly um, that is especially preferred by the Orioles, uh, Baltimore Orioles kind of in the springtime and even in the uh, kind of late summer passing through, they're big uh, on sugar. Another one that, that reminds me, I didn't, I didn't put it in there because it's not a very common winter bird, but we also have a species of hummingbird that will end up here. And in fact, there's one South Toledo here right now that will end up here. It's very widely traveled. Seems to kind of like during the non-breeding season move around called the Rufus hummingbird. And the natural, it's actually a retired naturalist from Metro Parks that he built this, uh, this like uh, feeder that has this like heating system. So it has like the nectar water 
um, and it'll keep it, it'll keep it warm. It, it, somehow it was like using a light bulb or something, right? heat from a light bulb. And it, it, it I think at last, uh, last I heard it was still uh, hanging out. The, the, the one that we do have here that will not stay, the ruby throat hummingbird does not really stay around. It heads south and we almost never see it, but this rufous hummingbird, this more of a Western bird, will, will end up moving around a lot more. And uh, there's even one here, uh, Vern Bingman, who teaches at uh, Bowling Green, uh, university, he had a bird uh, a couple of years ago at his yard. So they'll just kind of sometimes find their way over here. And of course, this is not no wildflowers. <laughs> There's no wildflowers, at least they're blooming until the uh, skunk cabbage here in February. Uh, not mm -hmm. not very known, well known for nectar, but um, they will sometimes happen by here and, and kind of look for anything they can oh, eat. Yeah. Use fruit? Um, you know, I think that they that they might even uh, they might try to grab uh, some fruit, any kind of any kind of insects that they could grab. It's definitely not their typical thing. But um, in terms of like surviving, I, I feel like uh, anything like even like uh, birds like um, the uh, swallows, like the tree swallows, like they're insect eaters. And I, I looked up there was one record on a Christmas bird count. I just like what the what were they eating? During the during December, and sure enough, like tree swallows will switch to fruit if they, hmm. you know, can't eat insects. Interesting. And so I, I think they they might do do some of that uh, as well. Anything that can, right, get some sustenance, but yeah, typically nectaring and, and and some insects too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. With the owls, are there a difference in colors between the male and the female? Yeah. Or is the bird? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Like that dimorphism, like you see, especially the cardinals are like a pretty familiar one. Uh, not so, not so much in owls. Um, uh, though, and I'm not looking at it, but like mostly, um, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty similar uh, in coloration. Though, as I look at that snowy owl, it reminds me that um, the younger birds generally have more of the black, and the older birds are more white. And it's the male birds that are also whiter. Uh, tend to be uh, in snowy owls, and the females still have some more of those dark colorations. Also interesting in comparing them, almost like side by side, you have to have them. The males are actually the smaller birds, and the females are the so bigger birds. You know yes, it's size. often, if you can see them together, probably seeing them just out in the wild, be hard to tell, oh, is that a male or a female? I don't know, it's a part owl. Right. But when you see them a pair together, the female might be a little bit larger. Interesting, with the great horned owl, the voice though, you think of the, uh, uh, the male, uh, it might be a higher pitched voice. Actually, the male is smaller, but has the lower voice. And the female, well, and you can hear kind of the, them responding. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, and so they have a different kind of voice. The female is bigger, but has a higher voice. Male smaller, has the, has the lower voice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good, good question. Yeah. Yeah, and that with the screech owl, that the color phases don't necessarily predicate with like the uh, uh, the, the female or male. It's just kind of how they're how they're born. Um, and it, it seems like I don't know if it's for certain, but we have a lot of the gray phase. We have more kind of gray trees, and like down south, we have more of like the red pines and things. But we tend to see a lot more of the the gray screech owls than the, the red. I saw one in the neighborhood though, right right in our backyard. They had like four. We called four babies. Wow. around there. And it's interesting too, just to watch them kind of like up close on a nightly basis. In the uh, winter time here, they're eating a lot more rodents and like small birds and things like that. But in the uh, summertime when they were raising them, I, I saw one fly down to the lawn, uh, the neighbor's lawn, and grab something that was like crunching. They were eating and crunching it. It's like, what on earth is crunching? And so I, I found one of their pellets. There's a, one of those ginormous beetles, a big beetle. Oh, okay. <laughs> their pellets are eating lots of big bugs. <laughs> The cicadas, those ginormous beetles, like the big moth that you see, like outside. Yeah. So they're eating a lot of bugs. Good, uh, a lot of big good. bugs. Eat yes. them up. Eat a lot of eat yeah. them up. ginormous moths trying to get into your house like a bird. <laughs> yes. They'll eat they'll eat those and yeah, the cicadas if they can find them. Uh wow. big, yeah, ginormous beetles that you're buzzing around your lights that are yeah. Wow. Unnerving how big they are. Yes, right? yes. That's, the, those are the screech owls where we uh will make a meal out of those. Yeah. Eagles are here all year round. Right? Yes, yes. That's, I was thinking that that was my another candidate. I was like, eagles are a winter. They're, they're the one uh, that we do see. And interesting, I think it was a couple of years ago, we had, uh, they'll be in like decent sized numbers. There was like 12 or 15 near Grand Rapids. They were all hanging out in one of the islands. Wow. Yeah. And so this time of the year, they'll also be, you know, a lot less territorial and get together. And sometimes in decent size, like a handful or so. 
And uh, they're another early nester too. Uh, they'll nest just a little bit after great horned owls, like about uh, March, they'll, they'll be nesting and um, we will see them uh, year round uh, too, yeah. How many nests do we have around? Oh, yeah, no, I don't know for sure, but I do know of a couple. There's at least a couple along the Portage River. One, I think, that's been around um, for a while, just uh, I think toward going towards Woodville, almost towards like Muskie County, as well as there's one near uh, uh, the uh, Fremont Pike and uh, uh, 23, that's Fostoria Road or Route 23, that's just a little bit to the south and the west. Uh, as well as one several on the Maumee River. I know I see a lot of birds up there, like Otsego Park. Um, and even near Perrysburg, there's like a, a pair that hangs out right near that uh, Hood Park, right right there near uh, just uh, west of downtown mm -hmm. Perrysburg. Um, and they are doing very well. I know it was, boy, it was probably back a while now, uh, about 13 or 14 years ago, that they passed over 200 deaths. Uh, and I wow. think it's still, yeah, yeah, they, they're doing awesome. quite well. Um, and I've seen them like sort of all over, like even the middle of town, the middle of West Toledo, see one flying over. And even right here, like Bowling Green, like the, mm -hmm. the farmland, you'll see them. The yeah, right, right. Farmland. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Running around on the ground. They were yes. Something yes, yes. I, I noticed that. I, I always wonder the same thing. I will often see them on the ground. Like, are yeah. they eating a dead thing out there? Are they chasing mm -hmm. rodents? Like, what yeah, on earth? What on earth kind of creature? Yeah, and, and they'll they'll do something if they will they will just get down on the ground and almost like 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 dinosaurs like, <laughs> run after it. I to fly after that one, just grabbing it. And, and yeah, and they're good scavengers. So anything that's dead over the winter, they'll, they'll come down there and eat it. Yeah, I yeah. I drove the dirt in the doctor's parking lot in Okinawa, and I looked, and there on this little tree was this little eagle, falling, You know. Yeah. And I thought. Oh my, I stood there and parked in and the guy got out and said, shh. <laughs> That's it. There's an eagle right there. An eagle. I didn't see it. I said, I just pulled in, it was sitting there. I was like, how did I see it? <laughs> I know. That's, that's often my response when, you know, I, I, of course, yeah, I'm mostly driving, watching the road, but also <laughs> for birds. Always, and just like great red, red tail fox will fly over the road or bald eagle. Like, okay, you may see them. <laughs> it's always like, it's like, anyone see all the things? I'm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I was watching a blue jay and yeah. right out the window of my, of my daughter's house. And I was like, looking right out there at it. And while I was watching that, a hawk came out, grabbed that thing and went, yeah. and flew off with it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he crushed it. I just like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I was just, <laughs> yeah. I know it, it does. It, it happens like, it happens so quickly. You know, it takes like, like <laughs> that just happen? That mm -hmm. not there, not there anymore. And yeah, you're right. Like it, you watch it with their uh with those talents, they're like the killing mechanisms. Like I think sometimes they of course, yeah, that the gruesome is like being stabbed, but like they're they're strong enough, they will just like crush the yeah. crush yeah. Yeah. Like, crunch, crunch. crunch. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Lord. I, I, I didn't see that. Another <laughs> <laughs> yeah. story I had uh, I had a 53. Chevy pickup truck, and this was five, oh, six, four wow. years ago. I'm going, this is in Southern California. Yeah. And I worked the second shift at this factory, and I'm heading home. I'm going through the woods, and this 53 Chevy has a window, a curved window at the back. So my yeah. head is like, I mean, it's this far from it. Yeah. Yeah. An owl flew down right at the, he was just scratching at me at that point. Wow. And I went, I got close to it. Oh, wow. I don't know what I, I was just glad my one other one yeah. was up. <laughs> when I grabbed you, yeah. grabbed you by the collar. <laughs> How dare you drive through here? It's my territory. <laughs> that's that's my best guess. Um, uh, right. Maybe there was a nest nearby and it just was ultra fired up. <laughs> fired up that day. It was gonna go after the truck. In fact, the, the barred owl, um, I mean, usually, and we'll do owl walks that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll call for them, and sometimes they'll come in and respond and check out who's what's going on. Every once in a while, if you're like close to a nest or they're just having a bad day, like they'll come down and and buzz you. And one of the bird watchers in the area was out at Oak Openings calling for a barred owl, and. 
he, he, of course, they, they fly very silently. Their wings are adapted for like very soft, flexible wings, and they fly very silently. And he like called for it, and one just came down and grabbed, <laughs> raked him across the head. And it was like, oh, wow. Well, that didn't feel very good. <laughs> <laughs> like, so he's like, all right, I'm going to call this a uh, call tonight. I go back. And he's like, so I didn't, I didn't see the bird. And I didn't hear the bird, but I felt the bird. <laughs> so as a bird watcher, can I count that that's on the list of birds that I've like, I guess, experienced? I, so. I didn't see it, I didn't hear it, but I know it was there because my head's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so they, and, and um, some of the birds, especially we're talking about the barn owl, that they uh, can almost hear uh, completely when it's dark. Um, they are well known, even when the like, even owls need a little bit of light, they will completely be able to hear. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Another. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Years ago, I decided that I was in Walmart and they had these woodpecker bars. Ah, uh, right, right. Yes. So uh, I thought, I'm going to give that a try. Yeah. Yeah. I went, we live 13 miles on, uh -huh. not, not, uh -huh. not too far from Bank. Right, 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 in one of our parks. And uh, I went up, and I nailed it up, put it up on a tree, and walked in the house, looked out the window. And it was <laughs> uh, I don't know if he followed me from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those, uh, I'd never yeah. seen it. I'd never seen one. I'd heard it. Yeah. There's a big woods around by our house. I've yeah. never seen one at all. Yeah. But when I walked in the house, look, he was there. Yeah. Um, the suet, the quick? suet cakes. Are they're, they're one that um, the, the woodpeckers seem to like really well. Other birds will come to it too, the chickadees, but the, the woodpeckers seem to like those, those suet cake holes. Oh, we, had, we had about six of them coming all the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. But you, you're talking, do you have a question about the owls? Did I, did I miss that? You're, okay, you're just talking about the owls. Yeah. Well, I just want to give uh, Jim a big round of applause. He is yeah. Love to talk about birds. Thank you. Um, it's it's very exciting offering these different cool programs. Yeah, yep, yep. Oh, and we do. We we have been out, um, uh, been out to parks and done uh, done hikes. Uh, we even uh, sometimes visit. I know, like Otterbein, Porter Valley, that they have a little uh, like a woodlot. We walk through there as well. Of course, walking at our parks. Uh, we 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 do yeah nature hikes and we try to get out to different parks. Too. In fact, we had a. It was a series of hikes. We I still do the series. It was once called Senior Hikes, but then um, I, I kind of uh, I kind of think, well, some folks are like, yep, yep, I'm a senior. Other folks are like, nope, I'm not coming to that. You just I'm not a senior. So we'll, <laughs> we'll never be a senior. Not just, don't call me senior. So we, made them, we called them hiking for help. And so it, it's it's mostly you know during the week and and, and, and folks that. Yeah. You know, definitely a kid for adults and sometimes older adults, any adults. But um, yeah. so, yeah, we, we try to, and we visit the parks and we talk about, we, we don't necessarily set any land records of, of, of good exercise, like like Lynn, Lynn back there getting exercise. And we, we don't do, but we do move around. That's something yeah. we said for just walking around and getting out into the, the park and the. Uh, we <laughs> yeah, good. I will. I will connect it. We kind of think of winter, a uh, winter break, but uh, yeah, in the springtime, we'll be doing those uh, again. So good. yeah, I'll have to connect with, sure. with Liz uh, and Rita on yeah, yeah, when those are starting to come. Yeah, yeah. You said 